What's going on? <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Happy New Year and welcome to a new episode of the Culture 316 podcast. I'm one of your hosts and producers, Jordan Nahisi. Join with your co-host, Mo. Not messing up the intro this time. <laughs> Well, what's what's going on, everybody? Thank you all so much for joining us uh, for this episode. And in this is our first episode of the year. So happy new year, as I said earlier. As usual, if you are listening on Apple Pop, Apple or Spotify podcast, be sure to give the show five stars. Be sure to subscribe. If you're listening or you're watching on YouTube, be sure to give us a like, a comment, and a subscribe. There's been a lot happening in wrestling. This week, I think it's just because my birthday was three days ago, but um, there's been a lot that's been happening in wrestling and we're not going to waste really any more time. We're going to get right into the show. So first thing is first, this past su- Saturday or Sunday, I believe, was AEW's World and coming from the Nassau Coliseum uh, in Long Island, New York, um, and a lot happened. A lot of opinions have been coming from that event. I just wanted to know kind of some of the takeaways that you got, Mo, and how you felt about AEW's World's End pay-per-view. They're not considered a premium live event yet, but pay-per-view. Um, well, I'll be honest, I did not watch it in real time, and I listened to the fans on which matches paying attention to, so you also pay attention to the last three. I paid attention to the last three, and I actually did very much enjoy Jericho versus um not Jericho, what the fuck? Edge versus Christian. That was very fun to watch. Um, and I love the story. I love the video pack sh- that they did for it. I thought it was a hard-hitting match. They kind of, like, indeed it up a little bit, but it still felt like I was watching, like, a WWE match, so I think it was mm-hmm. very digestible. Um, and I thought the match was fun. Um, I personally wanted Christian to go over, but I see why they went with Edge, of course. So that match was fun. Um... Eddie Kingston had a hard-hitting match with John Moxley, and he's the Triple Crown champion, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So shout out to my uncle. Okay, per to my uncle because when he right. won, the crowd just like hailed him like he was the guy. Like he's not even from Long Island. I think he's from like Yonkers, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But like New York, like Long Island loves Eddie Kingston. Anytime they came anywhere to like the neck of the woods, whether it was like Queens or Long Island or whatnot, Eddie Kingston gets a huge pop. Like, we just love Eddie Kingston. Um, and then the ending. The ending or the last match was uh, we had MJF versus Samoa Joe. Yeah. Um, and I thought the match was good. Um, I was very thrown off by, like, the testimony Long Island video package because, like, I just never see anyone proud to be from Long Island <laughs> before, and I'm from Long Island. <laughs> so I was like, what is this? Because we're kind of like the trailer park of New York, if you will. Like, <laughs> I'm glad you said it. <laughs> I'm like, glad you said it. Like, you see all those videos on TikTok and stuff where they talk about the boroughs and they usually sigh-eyed and shun Staten Island, but the real problem... <laughs> It's Long Island, so to see a bunch of people just proudly be from the dustiest parts of Long Island, <laughs> co-signing their love for MJF for being a Long Islander, it was just like, I cringed, I'm sorry. That took me out of it for a bit. I had to just fast forward. I was like, that that was just weird. <laughs> like, I don't know who signed that. That was just really weird. <laughs> but the match was very good. Um, I liked the ending, I was like, why they rush my man's like celebration? Like that was just he was in and out. Like I turned my head and looked down at my phone, looked back up, and like he was out, and 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 then they revealed. Um, and I wanted to ask you about what you think about the revealed Adam Cole. Oh man, it was fantastic. Um, I think that somebody said it online best is that professional wrestling is best when you reward those who pay attention. And I feel like all the signs have been kind of leading towards a Adam Cole reveal. Um, the fact that we saw Roddy and the kingdom kind of like be very, very adamant on the fact that MJF was the devil. I already knew that they were a part of it. Warlow had been kind of like poking at MJF it seems like he was a part of it or the situation. And Adam, if you paid attention in like a lot of the segments that they had, there were times where like Adam Cole had the devil mask in the locker room 
Or there was times where like the lights would go out and Adam Cole was in the ring and he would be like pretending to hide something or something like that. And it was like little things like that that you saw that kind of led you to believe, yeah, this is going to be, I think Adam Cole is going to be the guy that is the devil. And, you know, I feel like this was one of those things that was like a kind of like an easy read and it makes sense though. And I feel like it's interesting because public enemies posted something on their Instagram and they were like, well, you know, if Samoa Joe won the world title, what did Adam Cole uh, gain from being the devil? And I said that he gained himself at the beginning of the feud between MJF and Adam Cole. Uh, MJF would poke at the fact that like the guy that MJF looked up to was a former NXT champion, a former Ring of Honor champion, a former champion in New Japan Pro Wrestling, this smug, cocky, arrogant kind of prick character uh, that kind of propelled him to the top. Like this was the same Adam Cole that was the longest reigning NXT champion at a point was doing the, the best work of his career in NXT. The guy who, when he was in Bullet Club and Ring of Honor, was also doing some great phenomenal work. And I feel like at the end of this, this entire thing, we saw Adam Cole debut the Undisputed Kingdom. We saw, we see him as the leader of a faction. We see him gain that edge back. And I feel like that's what a lot of people have been waiting for is that Adam Cole to come back. And so... I was very, very, very happy at the fact that Adam was considered, Adam Cole was considered the devil, and I think he's about to cook. How did you feel about his reveal as a devil as well? I mean, I think everyone kind of knew it was him, so yeah. it was just like, okay, you know. <laughs> but I had to ask myself, was this build to basically put Adam Cole over, like, mm. was it worth the the risk, you know, of... uh kind of boring down MJF's title reign and putting him in this baby face position because mm -hmm. it was really fun in the beginning, but they dragged it out. Um, and I kind of wish now looking back at it that they kind of like, uh, they, they, they just gave the win over at, at a Wembley stadium mm -hmm. just because I mean, MJF can recover. I just feel like as a baby face, just, I don't know. It was just very bleh. Like, it's just not his mm. thing, and that's okay to admit that it's not his thing. Um, but it's just like, what now? Because are you going to further push him as a baby face? Because now he's going to eventually butt heads with Adam Cole to finish off mm -hmm. that feud. You can't, you can't just leave that hanging now that you know. Like, you have to continue that. Um, mm. So that's just my only thing. Like, I, I'm fine with Adam Cole having a faction because I think that that's where he works the best. Um, just, again... MJF being a baby face doesn't do it for me. And I don't think it does it for most people. So how are we going to salvage him when this all concludes? Does he align with him? I don't know. And I think that that's a great question because we don't even know if he's still in the company. Remember his, his, his kind of wrestler profile was taken off of AEW.com. Um, we've also heard rumors and reports that he did not resign with AEW uh, for 2024 and beyond. So we don't even know if he's a part of the company. And if so, that puts Adam Cole over more over more than anything, right? We also know that there's a potential that he may come back to AEW, but like he's been dealing with a lot of injuries. So, I mean, like either way, I feel like, can MJF come back and recover if he were to come back to AEW? Absolutely. I think that the door is open, not only for him to come back, but to also have a faction of his own. Um, we've been hearing a lot of rumors about different free agents. One of those guys is Alex Hammerstone, who I believe was in a former faction with him called the Dynasty back in MLW. So, I mean, there's always that potential for a reunion and there's always a potential for him to kind of come back. But we'll see. I just think that this was more about it was less about how MJF looked and it was more about how Adam Cole looked. And I think that th there was a priority in putting him over because I think that there's more dollars in Adam Cole having a successful 2024 than it is if MJF were to have a successful 2024 or a, a 2024 that would put him in the position of a, a main eventer. Um, so there's that. But I think that's kind of like my my little thing on. I mean, other than that, as far as World's End, I feel like there was a lot of cool little details. Um, yeah. Edge coming out in the WrestleMania 22 jacket. I popped for that. Um but there was a lot of cool stuff, um, and I think that 
you know, I, I do. I think it was the best show that they've put on. No, but I feel like they're 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 figuring not even just figuring it out, but they're trying new things. And they're just kind of going forward with it. And that's pretty admirable. So, yeah, that's pretty much AEW's world end. I would love to hear everybody else's take on it. Let us know in the comments below how you feel about it. But we're going to be moving on because that was not the only um, the only AEW controversial thing that's been happening this week. Because as the internet uh, kind of discovered, uh, Chris Jericho was implicitly accused of sexual assault um and the internet pointed at kylie ray as the person who was the victim uh there were certain sports entertainment journalists who said you know you don't quit the hottest fed over nothing the rumors kind of pointed at the fact that like chris jericho may have made a pass on kylie ray when she was in AEW, and she was kind of weirded out by it so she just kind of left there were also people saying that, like, once the stories come out about Chris Jericho, like, it, he's going to be like a Harvey a Harvey Weinstein ki- type of situation going on. It was a lot. Um, and he double-backed on it, actually, it, too. And he double-backed, yes. He double-backed. He, and it was guy was just like, oh, I don't think it was – I don't think it was Kylie Ray. So it was a whole saga. Um, but I wanted to know your your opinions on the situation and, like, your takeaways from this. Um, there's a lot to unpack with that. Um, first and foremost, I, I do believe that Kylie Ray, um, unfortunately was a victim just because she was in and out, in and out, in and out of the wrestling business. And it was like really weird, really erupt. And she always kept citing that it was mental health issues, but Mm -hmm. never being able to like fully express it. And I remember one time, like sometime during the pandemic or maybe 2021, I was like listening to her interview and she's, she's very, um, she, she's a very interesting woman. She actually like surprised me just like not seeing her do the whole smiley shit. You know, she's very yeah. interesting, but I felt like when I was watching her, her body language, when she was being interviewed on it, she was speaking as if she like, couldn't say too much. Mm. Um, and we know that a lot of weird stuff has gone on in the E so and we have seen other weird things happen on the indie circuit. I mean, we had the whole speaking out movement for crying out loud. Um, so it's not too far fetched to think that Kylie Ray wasn't a victim. Mm-hmm. Um, and for her to actively like the tweet, and again, like no one's mentioning Kylie Ray, like no one mentioned her at all, no one's talking about her, she's off doing her own thing. <laughs> for her to like lean in on that and like it. I felt like that was the closest she got to just like acknowledging that, hey, something did happen and this is the motherfucker, but I can't say something. So if someone else can like, you know, like I, I, I she has the right to acknowledge that I had a part in it, but I didn't say it. So I'm not going to get in trouble. And I these people have a lot of money. Um, and I actually think that the person who double back, double pack, double back most slightly because maybe Jericho or Tony Khan might have sued. I could totally see that happening. They have the money to do it. Not. Um. I don't want to say too much, uh, but uh, if that did happen to Kylie, I feel very, very much sorry for her. Um, I feel like women, women's wrestlers go through a lot. Uh, we're still, over time, slowly but surely unpacking and hearing some of their stories because a lot of them have been NDA'd. Um, and I don't really want to talk about it in detail. I'd rather wait till those those recordings those interviews come out on their own time to let them speak about their own story right. but it's just like a sad thing because being a woman in that business is already hard to get a spot and mm. it's really it, it must be really tough when you're trying to maintain a position and um you have like these higher figures who are in the best slots you know they're they're tight with the bosses and stuff like that they're doing wrong things but you can't ruffle their feathers or maybe stand up for yourself because like i really want to maintain my position and be in this business you Mm. know but they're pressuring you to do things that you don't want to do it must be a very terrible position, and if and I, I don't know the details of it. Obviously, that's up to Kylie to speak up whenever she can, and hopefully will, um, for her own sake. But um, I wish and hope that she's doing well with her mental health. Um, I did notice that Jericho didn't deny what he did, which is very telling. 
it leads me to think that maybe he has been. And then it kind of leads you to almost want to beg the question, um, did Tony Khan know? Because there was a press conference and he looked, he looked visibly annoyed that he was asked about it. Um, but it just leads you to just think, like, did he know this entire time and he was just sweeping it underneath the rug because Jericho was very valuable to the company being started and putting it on the map by taking yeah. a WWE figure that has very big, big name value and he just had to risk it because, again, the speaking out movement came out, everyone spoke up, and if you knew that this was the case, Tony, you look really bad as a company <laughs> having this guy here for as long as he, he was basically being the face of your brand. If that is the case. So this is a lot of things to unpack and I feel like it's still going. So it's hard to have like a full circle thought, but do you have anything to add on to anything I just said, Jordan? I will say this saying that going into a press conference and when you're asked about an incident like that and then saying, we have the safest record of any wrestling company. But like three months ago, you were just on TV saying that you feared for your life <laughs> when the punk thing happened. <laughs> it's kind of weird. But um, I mean, I like I to kind of piggyback off of what you said, like I, I think that, oh, wow, my light went out. That probably just whatever. Damn. Like, I feel like. I feel like it's very, 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 very telling. I think that there were some tweets that like Chris Jericho even liked where it was like, these cats are trying to cancel me and they're not going to, they're trying to cancel the GOAT. You can't cancel the GOAT. But here's what I will say though, right? And in regards to, because I think that that's kind of, that's kind of where this is leading to is like this idea of Chris Jericho being canceled. And I think that it's very important to note that the 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 idea or the the whole point behind canceling is to withdraw support, right? When you cancel somebody, you are withdrawing your support for somebody in light of the fact that they did something wrong. The problem is you can't cancel someone that you've never supported. And this is kind of the same issue that we saw in wrestling events, right? Was like, he gets accused of all these things. He, you know, he, he, he does this, he does that. We hear backstage stories about him. But when No Chance in Hell comes on, everybody's singing it once he comes out. When Judas comes on, everybody's singing it when Jericho comes out. And the reality is, I don't believe that Chris Jericho can be canceled. And it's not because he hasn't done anything wrong or he can't do anything wrong. But even if, like, he did all of these things wrong, let's let's be honest. His target demographic isn't going to care. That's the unfortunate part about professional wrestling. Because it is a male-dominated industry, it's also a male-dominated audience. And to be honest, we've seen people... We've seen people who have done egregious things in the past to women make their way back into the industry as if nothing happened. And it's just like, oh, but he's the goat, but he's the man and boo, 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 boo. But it's like, to be honest, I don't think that Chris Jericho can be canceled because even if he were to do all these things, the people that support him are not going to withdraw support of him. Like, it, it, and it's just one of those unfortunate things about the, the business. And I think the... That was this is gonna lead me into swerve, but I'm not gonna get into that. I was thinking that. about him but, too, as you said. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, like I, like that was a, the, the first. That was another name that came to mind because like we had all this whole discourse about protecting black women, but whose house swerves house came on, and it was as if nothing ever happened. The reality is that there's a lot of wrestlers who the mainstream world would cancel considering all that they have done and or said. But the reality is that because the fan base doesn't care about the things that they have done, they're not going to cancel him because it, it, that's just not where their value system lies. But, but some of these fans aren't even on the internet like that. Yeah, that's a fact. That's very true. That's also a, a very big, very big point. I'm not going to harp on it for too much longer because we got a show. But let us know how you feel about these accusations and whatnot. Uh, if you know the fact that Chris Jericho was accused, this is not saying that he did it. We are dodging lawsuits on this side. We are not saying that he did it. He has just been accused. <laughs> he has just been accused. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Okay, allegedly accused. Um, but yeah, we're gonna move on because 
this past mon this past Monday on Monday Night Raw, we saw a surprise return of the Great One, The Rock, uh, came back to WWE and also talked about the fact that he likes to sit at the head of the table and it got all the fans talking and it seems as if we are setting up finally the rock versus roman reigns now we have two big well three big premium live events uh, well two on the road to wrestlemania three including wrestlemania um but i think we're all trying to figure out is The Rock versus Roman Reigns, do you think it's going to happen at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view in Perth? Or do you think it's going to happen at WrestleMania 40 in Philadelphia? I mean, I could see them doing it only because of like the location mm -hmm. for Perth. But I feel like... It doesn't sound like it's a real place. I don't know why. Where the hell is Perth? <laughs> it's in Australia, bro. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, wow, all right. Uh that I don't for, I don't see them sending the rock to Australia. Mm. I don't, I can't see that. I feel like WWE cares about WrestleMania. That's like their money maker, you know? That's like it's like WWE's pension almost. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like since he didn't show up last year and like everyone was like begging for Dwayne to show up because it's like Hollywood Dwayne, oh, it just has to go together, but it didn't mm -hmm. happen. Um, because he just shows movies over us, fuck us, I guess. Um, I feel like if he wants to make up for it and he really wants and they really want to have like a knockout show, because we already have like a stack card, I feel like you should give it to WrestleMania. But some people are saying that it's not gonna happen because Cody needs to finish the story. Mm hmm so that's the part where I don't know, but if it, if it were me and I was booking it, I mean, Cody could take the back seat <laughs> one time. I mean, he's already been doing it all year, right? <laughs> For Dwayne versus the Rock, uh, the Dwayne versus the Rock, Dwayne versus Roman, I would totally risk having Cody sit out. Like that mm. is the money match. That is the match that's going to wrap up the bloodline storyline and in just the most correct way to where it's like the most memorable moment of the year. Mm -hmm. Why not? So what do you think? Elimination Chamber or WrestleMania? Both. I think we're going to get um because if you notice, um, there is a little trend here with the past three um WrestleMate the 10, 20, and the 30 were all world championship matches with three contestants involved in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Because it was Bret Hart versus Owen Hart, WrestleMania 10, and then the winner faces, I think the winner faced Yokozuna. Uh, and whoever won won. No, no, no. It was Bret versus Owen, and then Bret versus Yokozuna. And Owen beat Brett, but then Brett won't beat Yokozuna. At WrestleMania 20, it was um, Hunter, Sean, and the man who should not be named in a triple threat match for the World Heavyweight title. And then at WrestleMania 30, we had Daniel Bryan, Randy Orton, Batista. What I think is going to happen is we're going to get Cody, Roman versus The Rock because I feel like Rock and Roman at Mania is money. However, you can't just stop the momentum that Cody has. This is the first time I've ever felt like a baby face has been over as a baby face consistently for over a year for the first time in such a long time, especially for someone who is consistently in the main event scene. Mm -hmm. I feel like they don't want to slow his momentum down. And I feel like because of that, I feel like we're going to get a Cody Rome, a Cody Roman Rock triple threat at WrestleMania 40 for the WWE Universal Championship. You think The Rock can handle triple threat? He look kind of rusty with that little spot with Ginger. Well, here's the thing. If you have a triple threat, you can... Cody and Roman could throw Rock out the ring and just go at it, and then Rock could do a little spot here, and then Rock could do a little spot there. If And you think about it, a triple threat has the potential to hide a weakness of one of the contestants in the match if you book it correctly. And so I feel like a triple threat could actually benefit this full. I feel like the, a triple threat can benefit this story a lot 
So I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if they went down that route. Um, but yeah, I think that they're gonna do they're gonna do both. I feel like they're gonna do Elimination Chamber and potentially WrestleMania. So that's that's how I feel. I actually like that idea. It. I think I don't I think it's like a safe middle ground. But let us know how y'all feel about it. Is Rock versus Roman a WrestleMania match, an Elimination Chamber match, or is it both? Let us know in the comments below. But we are moving on. Because speaking of WWE, it it seems as if Mercedes Monet, formerly known as Sasha Banks, was previously talking to WWE about a potential deal. um, And those talks fell through. It also seems as if Mercedes Monet has signed with All Elite Wrestling. Once again, these are rumors. This is nothing is confirmed. We don't have no Mercedes Monet is all elite graphic. Um, if this is true, how do you feel about Mercedes Monet going to all elite wrestling? Well, first, I want to say I don't believe it because I'm going off of Jade and CM Punk with all these bullshit news and everyone just ends up in the E. So I feel like they're trying to tease us so people will pay attention to the Royal Rumble. But she may or may not even show up then. She might show up after. Um, that's my prediction, at least. It'd be really dope if she did show up at the Rumble. But I feel like they're just they're just teasing us. Because um, why would you push that news out? That, like, y'all mm. couldn't afford her. Knowing damn well y'all couldn't afford her. And you guys are, like, like basically, like, at the highest you possibly could be in your company. You got Cody. You got CM Punk. LA Knight's on, on the rise. The Bloodline um, storyline's amazing. It's just, uh, you got Dewey Stein and Jade. Like, you have so many people to work with. We have such a fun, full roster now. Um, and, again, like, they're really knocking out the park this year. So mm-hmm. it's just, like, if you got Mercedes... Uh, first of all, hey, let me wind it back real quick. If I was Mercedes, I would think it's way fun to be over there. I already know how this company moves. I already know that Vince is not in the way anymore. I know that I get to deal with Daddy Trips, you know, so I might just feel a little bit different. And that um, I, yeah, <laughs> Big Papa Trips. But I would know that since I'm coming back, things are going to have to be different. And now I'm coming back with some um, more value and, and, and entitlement just because I showed you guys that I'm money in a different continent bitch like i'm international Mm. you know don't you fuck with me so why would you not want to pay her what she wants knowing damn well every time um sasha banks comes back she gets the craziest pop she might have Mm -hmm. the craziest pop next to punk who knows but if she came to aew it's not that it's impossible or far-fetched it's just that it's there's still so much cleaning up to do with that women's division that it's just like it's it's a risk but Mercedes is a risk taker. So while I don't want to see her there because I would prefer if they tighten up that women's division and then put her in, um, I feel like her being her and her impact on the, the, the women's division while she was in WWE or her impact when she was in Japan, I could see her wanting to like take like a dominant leader role where she kind of face slips the whole entire division on her own. Mm-hmm. And, like, she did the impossible. Like, Kenny couldn't do it when he was leading them. Whatever the fuck Tony was doing wasn't working. I forgot who's leading them now. But I could see her posing the idea that, like, all right, if you're going to have me here, you're going to pay me X amount. But I get to have creative control on what we're doing here because this looks like an abomination. And I'm not going to stand for this shit with my name attached to it. So it has potential because she's there. I would just hate for it to fall stale. But if I had to choose, I actually would love it if she went back to the E. But what do you think? Funny thing is, I I actually agree with you. I think that the sheets are being worked. And I think that we're going to probably see Mercedes slash Sasha in in WWE. Um, she filed three new trademarks as well. Monet talks. I think Monet wears and something else. Um, but I also believe that we are now in an age where, I mean, like we, they've talked about it, that Triple H is going to be, this is the first time Triple H is in full creative control of the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania this year. Um, and so it kind of, this is the first time he's creatively um in full creative control. And we know when Hunter is in full creative control, 
that man is just as outside the box as anyone in this business can be. So I wouldn't be surprised if someone like Hunter is like, ah, uh, we're just going to like put up some smoke and mirrors and we're going to finesse and see um, and see Mercedes eventually land in WWE again. If she's in AEW, I wouldn't mind that either. Um, we we heard Tony at the World's End press conference say that he's going to be very, very active during free agency, which we already saw shades of that this past episode of Mon- of uh, Dynamite. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see her back in WWE. Tangent. And this is not just because I have unmedicated ADHD. <laughs> you, sp- you spoke about uh, the AEW women's division. Um, and it was so funny because I think you retweeted a video about Britt Baker and Britt Baker was like, listen, we have loud, passionate fans. And they said they wanted to see less Britt Baker on their screens. So I stepped back and, and then they were like, well, how do you feel about the women's division now? It's just like, well, you tell me, <laughs> I would just want to say, Britt, I'm so sorry. Cause you are right. I'm not going to even lie. You're right. The fans didn't want to see as much as you, you fell back. And now it's kind of rough. Like, I'm not going to lie. And so I apologize. At one point, I thought it was like Britt was on some like, she's complaining. She knows she got the juice. She knows she can step back in front at any point in time. She just doesn't want to because the fans said, no, I don't. We don't want you here or we don't want you as much. So she stepped back. And now. So I just had to address that. Britt, we are sorry. No, I'm never is. questioning you, Ben, because because you, you you were spitting, you were spitting, you was right. It's been flat right. since she left. I kind of literally with the mic. Literally, so I'll take it. But but as back to Mercedes, I think she's gonna land up in the E. Um, but either way, I'm gonna support her wherever she goes. But speaking of Sasha Banks slash Mercedes Monet, it seems like her best friend is heading home because it was reported that the current. TNA Knockouts Champion Trinity Fatu, formerly known as Naomi, is set to return to WWE. I want to know how you feel about Naomi possibly returning to the E uh, and if this is a move that you support. Um, well, I do believe and I could totally see her going back to WWE. I mean, her husband's over there. Um, hmm. How much longer do you really expect the woman to be in a different promotion far away from her man? Um, so that's that's number one. Um, number two, um, I'm very happy. I'm proud of her for like holding down her own in a separate promotion away from Sasha. A lot of people were saying that she's not going to survive without Sasha. They were clowning on her for going to Impact. Um, they were saying she wasn't going to make an impact no pun intended. While in the uh, TNA, I'm not going to keep saying impact and I'm just going to get my tongue twisted. Um, but good for her because she held on that title. Um, she looked like a star. She looked like she had a, good, a damn good time. It probably was like a bit of a vacation and gave her time to um, express you know, her creativity, which we got to see her do. Um mm. But I could totally see them bringing Naomi back because she is an asset. And there's so much you could do with her. You could insert her back into the women's division and, you know, as like a, maybe a collateral, like, you know, give her a title run, you know, right. and see what happens when she, uh, since she, she uh, held it down in, in TNA, like, you know, we could see the, the match she did over there. Now it's just like, all right, like the fans loved and followed her over to TNA. Let's just give her an- another run here in the E with maybe not the tag team belt, but with the world title, you know, Mm -hmm. or if she wants to have a ball down at NXT, she could also do that too. There's so many fun faces that I know that Trin could play around with, but also, I mean, she's married to one of the people that's part of the bloodline uh, controversy. So it's just like, you could really uh, pair her up with her husband and let that take on a story of her own, of its own. So there's so much you could do with her. Um, I totally believe she's coming back and I'm interested in seeing like what they would do with her, but primarily I do think they're going to stick her back into the women's division. What Mm. do you think? Personally, I think that first of all, I just want to say shout out to Trinity because she took a chance. She went to TNA slash impact and she upped her value. I've always considered her to be a valuable talent. I don't think that we've seen her be the face of a women's division the way that she was the face of TNA, not TNA's women's division. And we're talking about a women's division that is 
diverse, that is reputable, that has been consistently good for a very, very long time. She's had great matches. She's added things to her repertoire. Um, And so it's just very, very good to kind of see her be in a position where she isn't she isn't going to go back into a situation where she's going to be mistreated because she's shown how valuable she is. I personally believe that I don't think that Trinity needed anything physically or wrestling wise. She just needed to be in a creative environment where the people in that environment value her. And if yeah. this company is truly under the creative control of Vince, of not Vince, of Triple yeah. H, I know for a fact that Trinity slash Naomi is going to be valued and utilized in some pretty, pretty amazing ways. So I'm really, really excited about Naomi's potential return to the WWE if that is in fact in motion. And that's pretty much all I have to I have to say about that. But we want to know how everybody else feels about uh, Naomi possibly going back to WWE. However, we're not done there with the with the debuts and the returns because Tony Khan said that he was going to be busy during free agency and he wasn't lying because on this past episode of AEW. Uh, Dynamite, we saw the debut of Deanna Perrazzo. Perrazzo is a former uh, TNA knockout, well, Impact Knockouts champion, a former AAA Reina de Reinas champion, as well as a former Ring of Honor World Women's Champion. Um, And she is now officially on the AEW roster. I wanted to know how you felt about this acquisition uh, for Tony Khan and for AEW. Does it move the needle uh, how would you feel? How do you feel, I should say? Um, okay, so I like Deanna Perrazzo, but I'm not like a hardcore fan of Deanna Perrazzo. I noticed that like she does um entertain a certain, you know, audience. You know, there's there's always gonna be like different like niche audiences when it comes to women's wrestling. You you're gonna have people who wanna see gorgeous women that can wrestle, some people that just wanna see divas. Um, but I feel like when it comes to Deanna, she is like She's like very good on technical wrestling, and when people like watch her, they just want to see like a woman that kind of like wrestles a bit like a dude. I think that's like the appreciation, mm-hmm. Deanna. Like she she wrestles rough, um, she she wrestles rough, and she she wrestle wrestles like she's technical about it. So I feel like she's very fitting being in AEW, um, and I mean now she's she's back on TV. It's not her first time being on TV, but like now she's back mm-hmm. on TV, so that's still an upgrade for her. Now, do I think she's gonna be a needle mover? Hmm. I mean, I like the way that she debuted it, um, but she's speaking to Mariah May. Yeah, okay. Mariah May. Yeah, okay. Mariah May. I couldn't tell for a second. I saw a clip on Twitter, but like, I, like that that Barbie doll look looks very familiar. Um, I feel like that feud looked very interesting off of what it was. The crowd looked like they were into it. Um, and I, I could see them utilizing Deanna and probably working her way into like a title role. Um, just because she she could really could do it all. She she could cut promos, she could wrestle, and like I said, she kind of already has a fan base of her own because she she really held it the fuck down while she was in TNA. Like I don't know right. how long she had that belt, but it felt like forever. Like I felt like I saw her have a belt on her since like the pandemic or some shit. Like she was always right. doing something, and she was always pretty much like the headliner wherever she was at. So I think she's an asset. I think it's fitting. Um. I don't really see her ever coming back to the E. I think she would mm. stay there and she would do very well over there. I don't know what fuse I would see her in, though. Um, do you have any fuse? And what do you think about her being in AEW? I can definitely see Deanna versus Mariah May. I can see her versus Britt. I can see her versus Athena. I can see her versus um, Jesus, Tony Storm. I can see her versus Ruby. I can see a bunch of matches for um, Deanna. But I think it's very, very important to note that Deanna is another one. Deanna and Trinity were kind of in the same kind of boat in the sense that they were both in WWE. Uh, They both, you know, were no longer in WWE. And then they went elsewhere and they upped their value. And I feel like Deanna, especially I think Deanna was so accomplished and not only proved that, you know, that she is a phenomenal, in my opinion, a phenomenal wrestler, which I think that a lot of people saw glimpses of when she was in NXT, but she can also be the face of a division. And I think that um, AEW needs that. AEW can't just depend on Britt Baker 
or depend on the potential acquisition of someone like a Mercedes Monet. You need people in your division who can go and who are ready and, and not just workhorse people, people who you can put on TV as the face of your company. And I feel like Deanna Perrazzo is definitely someone who has that potential. Um, like I said, like you said, she can wrestle, wrestle. Like she is like she, her persona and like her gimmick reminds me a lot of Triple H's blue blood gimmick, which I thought was very, very interesting. But like, I think that like, she is just like a wrestler's wrestler. I, in another life, I would have loved to see her versus Natalia, especially like now I would love to see her versus Natty. But mm. like, I feel like Deanna is, she could be the face of AEW if they go about it correctly. And I just think that Deanna is going to be special in AEW. You know what I mean? And so I'm, I'm very eager to see what happens. But I want to know how everybody else feels. How do you feel about Deanna Perrazzo signing with All Elite Wrestling? But once again, the debuts doesn't stop there because last night it was Wrestle Kingdom 18 for New Japan Pro Wrestling. And we saw Brian Danielson appear. We saw John Moxley, uh, Will Ospreay, and I believe it was David Finley. Uh, and I think they were competing for the IWGP global championship a newly minted championship that is meant to kind of take the place of the u.s slash the united kingdom title it's kind of eerily similar to the intercontinental title that they unified with the world title but a new face popped up on the scene for new japan and it was none other than the man formerly known as dolph Ziggler, he sat ringside for the match, got into an altercation with David Finley at ringside, and then attacked him in a press conference after the match and kind of grabbed the belt and kind of insinuated that this is the title that he's coming for. So Dolph Ziggler is in New Japan. How do we feel about this? Because I have thoughts and I'm very, very happy, but I want to know how you feel about Dolph Ziggler appearing in New Japan Pro Wrestling and challenging for the IWGP Global Championship. You know, I was so wrapped up with thinking that he's going to just go to AEW just like everybody else that I didn't even think about New Japan. And then when I mm. saw that clip of him show up, I was like, wow, this actually makes the most sense. Just because, like, the way Dolph wrestles and, you know, he could keep up with, like, those long matches. He's obviously really good at wrestling, very good at selling. Um, he's going to make everyone else around him look fucking great. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel like he's a very underrated, underutilized star. And I think that he is very valuable to the company. Um, as soon as I saw him over there, I was trying to think of names that are still technically in Japan and Correct me if I'm wrong on any, on any of them, but I was thinking that it'd be pretty dope if I saw him, of course, with Okada, because that's, that's a no-brainer, right? Um, Will Ospreay is technically with New, New Japan. Is he? AEW. AEW. He's officially AEW. So I can't see that unless Tony Khan uh, does, does his little contract thing. Okay. Well, I wanted to see Will Ospreay versus um, Dolph Ziggler. Then I was thinking about um, Naito. Is that his name? Am I pronouncing yeah. his name wrong? Yeah. I thought that correct. would be really fun. Uh I mean David Finley's pretty awesome. Uh what's 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 his name? The guy that I like a lot that'd be technical wrestling his ass off. I'm having a brain fart. Zach right. Saber Jr. Yes. That'd be cute. That'd be really cute. I need that. I need that now, actually. So <laughs> I feel like there's a lot to do with uh, to do with Dolph. God, I was just tongue twisting this now. But um I think that is very fitting. Um and he's gonna actually have like you know, a lane of to call his own, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like a long time waiting because I just feel like he's just been idle while he was in the E. Um, he's been keeping himself busy and stuff like that. But I, I would love to see him like be presented as like top of the top and work his way up to the, like the world title. So what do you think about it? I think that this was the best move for him. Um, I feel like one of my concerns with AEW when it comes to the men sometimes is that they have such a loaded roster that they put you in, put you in the main event scene, and then you lose, and then you die out, and then the momentum is slowed. But I feel like in this case, New Japan's kind of decreased momentum benefits someone like a Dolph Ziggler because Dolph Ziggler is the star power that they need and the wrestler that they need. This is someone who a lot of fans around the world and a lot of wrestlers 
know him to be a guy that's at the top of the food chain as as it pertains to his wrestling ability, as it pertains to his matches, his 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 uh his ability to storytell in the ring. And I feel like when you put a guy like that in a ring with any one of your wrestlers, that wrestler is going to automatically look better. And if Ziggler holds the title, then that that title is going to mean something. And I think it's just going to be a great story for him because this is someone who we've been clamoring for to see as a world heavyweight champion or as a WWE champion. And I feel like while he may not get that opportunity now, he's going to be able to be just as reputable of a world champion and of a face of a brand as he would have if he were to still be in WWE and if he were to have been given a proper chance. So I'm, I'm very, very eager to see where this goes. But Dolph Ziggler versus David Finley is definitely going to be a banger, in my opinion. And I think that New Japan is, is the perfect home for, for, for Dolph Ziggler. But I want to know how everybody else feels about um, this potential... Uh, match and Dolph Ziggler arriving in New Japan Pro Wrestling. But we're going to move forward because Triple H and WWE announced today that they have a blockbuster weekend set up for this summer in Toronto, July 5th, Friday Night SmackDown, July 6th, Money in the Bank, and July 7th, NXT Heat Wave, all emanating from the Scotty Bank Arena in the heart of Toronto, Canada. I want to know how you feel about the Money in the Bank pay-per-view or Money in the Bank weekend heading to Toronto this summer. It's pretty dope. Um, huh, do we have any like uh, people from Toronto currently there that uh, are on the roster? They probably would just get a big pop know. from them. I don't know, to be honest. I mean, the only person that gone. came to mind was Trish Edge. Is gone. Yeah. <laughs> Edge is gone. Trish is gone. Like, I don't know who else is going to get a big pop. but uh, Wait, no. Uh, where's Kevin Owens from? Oh, no. yeah. Kevin there Owens, Sami Zayn. Well, there they're we both go. from Canada. They're not from Toronto. Whatever. So. Still, they're going to get a big pop just from being Canadian. Yeah. Um, that's pretty awesome. Um, I mean, I, I could, they ever had a Toronto crowd before? They had. They had to. Because Trish came out with a leaf on her ass before. So, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> they definitely went to Toronto. <laughs> that's the only reason why I remember. A leaf on her ass is crazy. But that makes sense. Keep going. Up, keep going. Yeah. Up. No. 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 Just say. <laughs> um, what should I call it? I can't remember what a what a Canadian crowd is like. They're hot. They're hot. They, they are. They love I, wrestling. I know. I know for a fact they love wrestling. They showed out for um Worlds Collide or um Forbidden. I should not Worlds Collide. Forbidden Door. When they showed up, when AEW showed oh, up did. with with Forbidden Door, they were hot. Um. There have been some pretty big moments that have come from Toronto. I, the first thing that comes to mind, Unforgiven 2006, which was Trish's actual retirement match, and when Edge and Cena had the TLC match. And uh, I shouldn't have thought about Champion. the screwdriver. Oh, the, the, well, the, that's Montreal, the, no. uh, the, the screw job. That's in Montreal. But <laughs> to, yeah, Toronto is a very, so very big. Ca- Canada in general loves wrestling. So I'm I don't I think it's gonna be a pretty, pretty hot crowd. And I think it's just it's adding on. I think, bro, they got a, a stacked little P- PLE schedule because we have the Rumble's obviously gonna be in the US, Elimination Chamber is gonna be in Perth, then you have Mania in Philly, then you have, you know, Money in the Bank in Toronto, you have Bash at Berlin in Germany, you have Backlash in France, like so they have a pretty stacked international PLE schedule, and I think that Toronto is is great. It's a great, great, great addition. I'm I am like very much on the edge of possibly going because I I really I've been dying to go to Toronto anyway. Only because someone so told we'll, me if I don't come, so I might have to go get a passport I mean, finally. <laughs> Come on. You out here passport list says come yeah, on. Yeah, I know. Got- poverty. <laughs> Not poverty. <laughs> but I, I I do I think that this is gonna be really, really good for them. And I, I may have to go up to the six. I may have to visit my little friend Aubrey up in the six and 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 and, uh, and make Aubrey. that a thing. But let us know how y'all feel about uh WWE Money in the Bank coming from a uh, Toronto, Canada this year. It should be a, a a movie, but let us know how you feel about this in the comments. Uh, but we're going to be moving on. So also Triple H was kind of talking about the year, the 2023. 
that uh, WWE has had. And he says that it was WWE's biggest year ever. And he cites that multiple records are broken. If you're looking at me and I'm looking at my screen, it's because I'm looking at the notes because I don't want to miss anything. So he says that there were multiple records broken. And that includes the highest social media views ever, highest merchandise revenue ever, highest sponsorship revenue ever, and highest grossing ticket sales ever. And obviously, this comes on the heel of a very, very successful WWE Live holiday tour uh, where they had a record gate for eight shows and I believe four sellouts. They were in New York, L.A., and some other cities. But 2023, WWE's biggest year. Um, why do you believe that WWE had their biggest year this year? Um, well, uh, we kind of covered some of this stuff before we hit record on the last show. And we're just listing yeah. like all like the major accolades they had, like month by month, they had something major or news breaking happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you, you could like, you could think a, a handful of people. I mean, we had like people like Cody show up. We had people like Trish show up. Um, we had some unfortunate things that happened, like with Bray happening. We have obviously CM Punk towards the end. Um, rest the whole Bloodline storyline was just like you know must watch, and it took up most of the pay per views, and everyone was dying to come just to see the Bloodline. Like they were a box draw. Um, WrestleMania was outstanding this year. Um, I mean, they had they had what they had in Puerto Rico a Bad Bunny. Like, even if you're not liking wrestling, you're going to show up for Bad Bunny. Um, let's be honest. So mm-hmm. I just feel, and you could probably name a whole bunch of more things. I'm I'm probably list, missing like 10 of these things. But it's just like, just back to back. What? Give me a face. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Jordan's <laughs> face, bro. <laughs> but no, it's just. There's so much that went on throughout the year, month by month by month, something juicy was happening over in the E. I'm not shocked at all. And CM Punk just being like the final cherry on top. Yeah, I'm not surprised that this is their greatest year. Um, I think out of all the promotions that people are really like paying close attention to, the E got it. So if you're an E drone, like <laughs> I know that they're over here celebrating and say, yeah, yeah, we chose a winning team. Like y'all should never have left this side. I get it now. All right, y'all got it. Y'all literally got it because they've been knocking it out the motherfucking park. Mm-hmm. But Jordan, I want to know what was your take and why you made that gasping face. So first things first, we finally have a name and a promo picture for the reality show featuring Bianca Belair and Montez Ford. <laughs> Love and WWE debuting on Hulu on February 2nd. Uh, the tagline is marriage is the ultimate tag team. So that is we have so a name. Cute. We have a name, we have a date, we have an outlet, it's official. But stuff like this is the reason why WWE had its best year yet. I mean, we can can start from the top of the year. There's There's so much that happened in WWE that you can't keep track of it all. There were so many memorable moments. We can talk about... Starting at the Royal Rumble when Sami Zayn betrayed the bloodline. That happened in 2023. But because Jey Uso pinned Roman and we saw the return of Randy Orton and we saw the return of CM Punk and we saw the signing of Jade Cargill and we saw a whole bunch of stuff that happened in WWE. It's so it's so hard to keep track of it. Not to mention the fact that we saw the rise of LA Knight. Not to mention that we saw... Um, Jesus, I'm like losing track. Uh, we saw the beginning of the Jay and Jimmy feud. We saw um, K- KO and Sami oh, Zayn. John Cena the, came back. I forgot. John Cena him. came back, reunited with with uh, The Rock. Like mm-hmm. there's so many things that happened in WWE, and I think it's all rooted in the fact that I feel like the competition between WWE and AEW has made both products better. And I feel like competition, like Eric Bischoff said, competition creates cash. And in this particular instance, uh, con- competition has forced AEW and WWE to step up their game. And I, But I feel like WWE has, once again, has been knocking it out of the park from the beginning of the year to the very, 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 very end. Um, and obviously, in addition to all that, WWE and UFC merge for TKO. And so that's another big thing. Like the fact that like they 
the fact that WWE sold for nine point some billion dollars and we didn't even consider that a top moment just shows you how much WWE has how much WWE has been doing. But WWE, I believe, also has seen its biggest reach ever this year because what like you said we saw bad bunny at backlash we also have logan paul's the united states champion like, oh, like, like we forgot that. like we forgot that all this is happening but like he had that part big of the moment with ricochet that with ricochet the at the royal rumble yeah. so it's like all of these moments i think have contributed to wwe being successful this year and i think it's a formula that we're going to see being replicated in 2024 international ple's including more uh, uh, celebrities who actually like wrestling um, and just taking advantage of the partnerships and relationships that they already have. But yeah, that's kind of it when it comes to WWE in 2023. But let us know why you believe that WWE had its biggest year ever in 2023. Let us know in the comments below. But that concludes our show for today. Once again, Happy New Year. I, we're trying to start a broadcast channel for Culture 316. If not, we're probably just going to have like a group chat or something like that. And that's where we're going to talk about all of the podcast releases as well as merchandise, which will be coming out soon. And on top of that, when we ever we have a 316 space, um, we'll <laughs> update that chat as well. But yeah, follow us on Instagram at Culture 316 um, for more updates and information and all that good stuff. But until the next time, I'm Jordan Ahisi. That's Mo. And we'll see you guys next week. What was that? <laughs> New Sounds 2024.